500 years ago, some of the greatest scientific minds in the world uh, turned their attention to developing flying machines that would allow heavier than air manned flight. And as a first step, they looked around the natural world for examples of flying things, and they saw how birds flew, and how mosquitoes and dragonflies flew. And over the next 200 years, came up with a bunch of brilliant ideas that leveraged stout flapping wings and a mechanism to flap them. And some ingenious designs were innovated. And these are some of the da Vinci designs, and some perhaps less ingenious than others. <laughs> and some of them that actually flew, at least in scaled model form. Ish. But it wasn't until science looked beyond biomimicry, until they looked beyond flapping wings and copying Mother Nature and designed the propeller that heavier than air flight became a practical reality for man. It seems that because of the limitations that Mother Nature had to make due to the mechanism of natural selection and because of the materials she had to work with, uh, flapping wings was the best option. I mean, it's hard to imagine a powered, rapidly spinning propeller made out of bone, muscle, and tendon, let alone a turbine or a jet engine. Uh, and there's some really wonderful parallels between this period that uh, the evolution of aviation went through and what we're trying to do now to develop the next generation of artificial heart. So uh, what uh, Dr. Bud Frazier and I would like to do is talk about a body of work spanning over four decades that may someday <clears throat> in the very near future provide us with the first practical mechanical replacement for the failing human heart. Uh, everybody knows heart disease is a big deal. It's the number one killer of men and women. Uh, before we did this, though, we had to answer a very simple question. Do we need a pulse? Now, Bud, you spent the first 25 years of your professional career developing mechanical pumps that made a pulse. Uh, pumps that were implanted in a patient that would actually fill and eject, fill and eject, just like the human heart. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, Billy, I started uh, to medical school in the early 60s. I was an English history major. I cared little about science, actually. And uh, I actually dropped calculus before I flunked it. But uh, the, uh, I did go to Baylor. And Dr. DeBakey, who was the chief there, had to, got an artificial heart grant. We all had to do research work as medical students. And my research work was with the artificial heart. Probably, though, the thing that influenced me most was when I was on the surgical service. I worked up a young Italian boy who came here with his mother, teenage boy, to have his heart repaired. Was looking forward to getting back to work, back to a normal life. Very delightful young man. We, I participated in the surgery the next morning. Surgery went well, but that evening he arrested. As I was the youngest one there, they opened the heart and I massaged his heart. It was very disturbing because the boy awakened and actually reached up as if to touch me while I was massaging his heart. He eventually, of course, died, unfortunately. But it occurred to me at the time, if my hand could keep this boy alive, why can't we develop a pump that would do the same? So for the next 20 years, I worked on a partial artificial heart to take over the work of the failed left ventricle. It was an implantable pump. It really was a disruptive technology that really enabled patients to actually go home. Uh, I, I implanted the first one of these pumps to let, let a patient go home in 91. It had two big limitations. One was size, as you can see, this patient is a big man. He did very well. He actually went back to work uh, in, in the hospital and was the first patient discharged from a hospital. He, he could go through unnoticed, as, as you see, in our cafeteria. The limitations, though, size, it only really fit in large adults, but the most uh, damning uh, problem was durability. So here's the pump that Dr. Frazier's talking about. It's a metal can that sits actually in the abdomen, and it's hooked up to the failing heart, and another tube hooks up to the aorta, the biggest blood vessel in the body. And there was a pusher plate that went back and forth, so it reproduced the pulse. It ejected in spurts, not unlike the, uh, the native heart. It was biomimicry. But here you can see how big the device is. And really on this x-ray you can see, so you could really only put this in the largest patients, but its biggest limitation, as Bud just said, was this. It had to do this once a second, which is 100,000 times a day, 35 million times a year, and there's no man-made device that can do that. And 
The cyclic fatigue would cause the flexible membranes to break or the internal membra- uh, mechanisms to, to wear out. And after a year or two, it would break. And it was very frustrating. These were gravely ill patients who would have this very large operation and would just be in the recovery phase when the device would fail and they could either have another very large risky operation, an emergency transplant, or they would die. So this era taught us that, you, that these pumps can save lives, but we had to come up with a better way to pump blood. And maybe that's what our good friend Dr. Richard Wampler was thinking when on a field trip to Egypt he saw two workers using an Archimedes screw to pump water up a river bank. An Archimedes screw is basically a big spiral in a tube, and Wampler watched this and thought maybe that'd be a good way to pump blood. So when he returned home, he made a metal version of it, a little small metal screw, screw about as big around as a pencil eraser, and he put it at the back of a plastic tube. Here's the tube, and the, the little Archimedes screw is here, and he surmised that if he could spin that screw fast enough, he could pull a meaningful amount of blood out of the failing heart through the tube and through the circulation and treat heart failure. Now this is in the 1980s. There was no motor small enough or powerful enough that could fit inside on this device. So he came up with a very clever idea of putting the motor on the patient's leg outside the body and running a spinning cable up through the patient's leg artery to the heart. Uh, Nobody had ever seen a device like this. Because the motor sat outside, it was only a temporary device for a week or so, but it was very, very clever. Nobody had ever put a rapidly spinning anything in a patient. Now, Bud, you had already you had established yourself as a leader in this field and were the only advocate of continuous flow on the national scene, so he brought it to you. What did you think? Well, I didn't think it would work. I thought, uh, you know, it, it, it looked like to me it was a potential wearing blender for blood. It was spinning 25,000 RPM. Uh, I thought, as you can see, this thing would destroy the blood cells. However, I followed Claude Bernard's advice, put my thinking camp up on the outside of the lab, did the research, and in fact, it didn't destroy the blood. Uh, I think uh, after about two years, we implanted this first in a patient who was dying of a failed, uh, rejected heart. And uh, we were able to actually reverse the rejection after six months of support, and this patient lived another 10 years. So this was an amazing event in the evolution of what was going to be a rapidly expanding field. This was the first demonstration ever that you could use a rapidly spinning pump to move blood without injuring the blood, and the first time a human being and human physiology had been supported by continuous non-pulsatile flow. And it was a big departure from biomimicry, from the beating heart. And this opened up a whole field and a number of new devices hit the scenes over the next decade. This is one that Dr. Frazier and Rob Jarvik were working on. It was a self-contained device for longer term implantation to rival those big pulsatile devices. They were having problems with bearings and axles in the blood and stuff, but encouraged by the success of that temporary device, they pushed on and very soon came out with this pump that actually went inside the heart and took blood from the failing heart and uh, pumped it into the descending aorta, the biggest blood vessel in the body. And this is another pump that was developed largely at our facility. This is called the HeartMate II, going from the aorta to the main blood vessels. This is the most frequent pump implanted worldwide. It's actually approved by the FDA. This is the one Dick Cheney has. And although there are now eight or nine pumps in various stages of clinical approval, they all share some common features. First of all, they're much smaller. This is the big pulsatile pump we were talking about. Look how much littler these are, and they're easier to implant. But more importantly, they're simpler. They have one moving part, no flexible membranes. Uh, this is a lot like that Archimedes screw that, uh, that uh, Rich saw the Egyptian workers use to pump water. And all these devices are very similar. There's a battery outside the body, a wire going in through the belly wall that goes to a microcomputer, and these are electromagnets. It rotates or precesses the magnetic field. This has a fixed magnet in it and rotates with them. Uh, So uh, the very first one of these, after extensive work in the laboratory, was implanted at the Texas Heart Institute by Dr. Frazier in 2003, right when I came down from Boston to join him. Uh, And now, uh, in 2012, 11,000 of these devices have been implanted. And with that clinical experience, we made some very interesting observations. Now, this patient was the first patient to have a pump, it was a Jarvik pump, as a destination therapy. That is, not as a bridge to transplant. He was bedridden. He recovered. He toured the world, wrote two books. He was an author and died of unrelated causes seven and a half years later. 
we were very gratified to see that the pump had nearly no wear on it. And uh, I'm sure these pumps will last 15 to 20 years. And in addition, it allows the patients to go back to full and active lives. Uh, fortunately, it didn't let Cheney go back to hunting, but it, it, uh, but it, it was, uh, here you see this young boy playing tennis, going to work every day, four and a half years after he nearly died in our hospital. One of the really interesting findings though is we started seeing patients that lost their clinical pulse. This was the first patient that came back in without a pulse and we followed him for a year without a pulse. His heart was still beating, but because his heart was so weak and the turbine was turning so fast, the pump was turning so fast, we couldn't feel a pulse. And this particular patient we followed for several years without a pulse and that got us thinking do we really need one, or is it like the propeller? Is this one of the compromises Mother Nature had to make because of the mechanism of natural selection and the materials with which she had to work? And so we started a series of experiments in our lab to see, do you need a pulse? And as a first step, we took calves, young cows, it's Texas, and we would cut the heart out and replace it with two of these rapidly spinning pumps. And here's a, an x-ray, here's one of the pumps, here's the other. So we're injecting dye in the veins. You see it going out through the pulmonary artery, coming back to the left side of the heart, and going out through the aorta. So this is a whole heart replacement device with only two moving parts. And amazingly, these animals would stand within hours of surgery. They would eat, they would drink, they would react to caretakers. They seemed for all the world like normal animals, but they had no pulse, they had no heartbeat, and their electrical activity of their heart was gone. They were a flat line. And so we were really encouraged by this and started wondering, could this be the next generation of artificial heart? I say next generation because there was an artificial heart that's been developed over the last 30 years, incrementally, since the 80s. But it was a pulsatile device that mimicked the natural heart. And as such, was limited just like the other devices by durability and size. Durability, it's mainly used to keep patients alive until a transplant. And size, the driving mechanism that drives compressed air in and out to the devices outside the body. Now this device has saved countless lives. It's been implanted in a thousand patients, but we thought this new technology could address some of the limitations of this. And so over the next five years, we worked through using different pumps, and th these, uh, these are the adapters. That was kind of fun. We had to figure out ways to make those, and those initially in the first 30 animals were made out of stuff from Home Depot. We would actually uh, take uh, silicone caulk and drywall tape and stuff, but you can see here are the animals. Uh, this animal is now two months out from having his heart replaced. He's got no pulse, no heartbeat, walking on a treadmill and eating molasses. So this was a very, very exciting time for us in the evolution of this field. And we now have done 65 uh, animals. We had a patient come in with terminal amyloidosis of the heart. He was a small man dying with this awful disease. After long, extensive thought and work on him, we decided the pump was the only thing that might save him, allowing him to be transplanted. We implanted this pump uneventfully. As I said, we'd already done six years of work in our experimental lab. And this patient who had been comatose, woke up, was able to visit with his family, able to work on his computer. Unfortunately, he had progressive disease of the liver, kidney and lung, and we lost him about five weeks uh, after the support was initiated. Well, this was a really exciting first step in the continuous flow of artificial heart. And from our animal experience and our limited human experience, we're sure this is the future. This was a little bit like the Wright Flyer at Kitty Hawk, but now we're working on devices that have one moving part, that have no bearings, that are magnetically suspended, and we're fairly confident that this is the future of this field. This is a device that we're working now uh, on with Rich Wampler. You know, medicine is a, not a, a true science. It's really a soft science. It's more of an applied art. It, you might say it's a metaphysical need of man that we have to take care of our fellow human beings. These two young girls were dying of heart failure and they were saved by this small, pulseless pump that Billy has described to you. As you can see, they're young, healthy girls uh, at, a, at a recent uh, heart ball in Houston. I suppose you might say that their hearts have been touched 
by, and the fire had been lit by the young Italian boy who died more than 40 years ago in our hospital. Thank you.